Amen. Thank you very much to our youth handbell ringers for beginning us in worship today. My friends, this truly is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. What a wonderful gift it is to be gathered together on a cold and rainy morning that uh, we might be able to praise God together here at Unity Presbyterian Church. I welcome all of you who are here in person as well as those of you joining us online that together we might create this unique and wonderful community of faith that lifts its heart and mind and voices in praise to God. I particularly want to offer us a warm welcome to guests and visitors who are with us this morning. It is always a great joy for us to share our worship of God with you. I hope that everyone will take time to sign the friendship pads as you find them on one end of the pew or the other. This is a chance for us to have a record of all those who've come to worship here in the sanctuary, as well as for you perhaps to meet the, uh, someone who's sitting on your row with you. So as the friendship pad is passed, please everyone sign your names. If you are a guest or visitor, please also include your address or your phone number or email, some other way that we might be in touch with you in this week that is ahead, just to say welcome and to say thanks. And if you are looking for a church home, I do hope that you will find Unity to be a place of worship and service that God might be calling you to be a part of. If that's the case, you can speak with me or speak with someone sitting near you so that we might follow up on that interest as well. As you're filling out those friendship pads, we have a bulletin full of opportunities and announcements and ways to be engaged in life and worship and service together, and I, I draw your attention there. We did have a wonderful day yesterday with our marriage event and uh, over 110, I think, uh, who were able to come. And I wanted to say, if you're interested in following up with that event, uh, please do take time to sign up to be a part of one of the small groups that will begin meeting um, next week. So, uh, so see information in your bulletin about that. Tomorrow evening is the last of our three in the mental health series. Uh, that event will be tomorrow night at 6.30. And the topic this week is hospice and palliative care. So I hope that you'll come and be a part of that conversation. And also a special word of thanks to those who were a part of hosting Family Promise this week. The preschool fundraiser continues and finishes today. You'll find information about that in your bulletins, ways to give online to the equipment fund and the scholarship fund. We're preparing for Go Mad Day, which is a morning of service uh, in a wide variety of organizations and opportunities throughout our community. That will be on uh, Saturday, March the 11th, and you can sign up for that online. I particularly want to draw your attention to two of our new projects this year, new organizations that we're partnering with. One is Pathways, which works with homelessness in York County, and the second is with the Pilgrims Inn. I hope that you'll sign up to be a part of all of our projects, but particularly lift up those two for you this morning. Also, uh, due to popular demand and a very kind screen printer, the deadline has been extended for Unity t-shirts. Uh, so if you did not quite get your shirt order in, uh, you can still do that for about another week. Um, and so thanks to all those who have already signed up for their new shirts, but the demand has been such that we've been able to extend that deadline for another week. So uh, please sign up for your shirt if you've not had a chance to do that yet. Next Sunday will be a marvelous Sunday for us as well, as we'll have a guest preacher, uh, Dr. Rodney Sadler from Union Presbyterian Seminary, will be with us at both services. Uh, he is a, a wonderful preacher and great teacher and leader, and we're so grateful that he'll be with us next Sunday. He'll also be speaking briefly at the Congregational Pancake Breakfast that'll take place during the Sunday School Hour next week. So not only come to hear Rodney preach, but come to eat pancakes uh, next Sunday morning as well. 
Uh, next Sunday afternoon, we also have the organ recital. You'll find information about that in your bulletin too. We are rapidly approaching the season of Lent, and so make plans and preparations to begin that season on Ash Wednesday, which is um, February the 25th. And you'll find also devotions in the narthex that you can pick up as part of your preparations for that day too. Leader Fest from the Presbytery is coming up. We have uh, Catherine McGregor and Steve Simon and others from our congregation who are leading workshops. So that, that is coming up on February the 25th. And it's not, not too soon to begin thinking about Easter. So if you would like to order your caterpillar, be sure that you talk to Catherine McGregor or find other opportunities to be a part of that uh, unique way that we celebrate Easter here at Unity 2. My friends, God is doing such amazing, wonderful things. So let us come and continue our time of worship together. I invite you to rise in body or spirit as we join together in our call to worship. We gather here as the body of Christ, God's working together. God calls us to worship, to hear the good news and sing our praise. For we are the hands and feet of Jesus here and now. Let us worship the living God.
Please be seated. God has given us God's statutes, but we follow our own desires. We know of God's laws, yet we try to justify our own way. And so let us now confess our sin together and then silently. Let us pray. Holy God, we confess that we have turned our hearts away from you. We bow down before the gods of convenience, self-reliance, greed, and bitterness. We do not listen to your commandments and forget our neighbors. Forgive us, God, and mend what is broken. Turn us back to you, mysterious and mighty God, that we may observe your commandments and walk in your ways. Amen. Friends, God is always offering us another chance. God is always offering life and abundance. Turn to God and receive the good news. Yesterday, today, today tomorrow, tomorrow, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to God. be seated. Our first reading this morning comes to us from the Gospel of Matthew, the fifth chapter, reading verses 17 through 20. Let us hear God's word. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come not to abolish but to fulfill. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away, not one letter, not one stroke of a letter will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. At this time, let me invite our young friends, the children, to come and spend a few moments together with me here on the steps. I've got a special guest helping with me this morning as well. If you're watching on the screen, please draw near so that you might be a part of this special time together as well.
good morning. How are y'all today? Good, good. A few more friends coming. It's good to see you this morning on a cold and rainy day. What a, what a great opportunity it is that we might be a part of worship together. Thank you so much. Worship's always better when you are here. I've got a special friend with me today. This is Matthew, and he is a part of our youth group, and he's going to help me with our time for children today because today is a special day in which we are talking a little bit about blankets here and Church World Service blankets. That's right. So... Do some of you have a favorite blanket or had one when you were little? And you all have blankets? Some of you do, yeah. Was it big like this blanket or was it small like this blanket? What color was your blanket? Anybody have yellow blankets like this one? No? Okay. There are a lot of things we could do with our blankets, such as... We can snuggle up in our blankets. When it's cold, we can also wrap our blankets around ourselves, keep us warm. Do you ever do that with your blankets? Yes, right, yep, okay, good. What else? We can use our blankets as a fort. Oh, okay. So we almost have to put them up like this, huh? What do you think? Like that? You ever make a fort with your blankets? Okay, yeah. Any other ideas? Or you could use it like Superman. Oh. All right, yeah, lots of different ways, right? So, well, good. Lots of ways we can use our blankets, right? And um, one of the things that we can remember is that, um, is that sometimes, you know, there are storms that come, right? Storms that come. And if our, if our storms come, sometimes, uh, you know, you have to leave your house and, and go with your moms and dads and find a good, warm, dry place to sleep. And sometimes, and that happens, kids can't even bring their blankets with them. And they end up in a place without their favorite blanket, and they might need, that, need one to really help. And so one of the reasons on this particular Sunday each year, we do the Blankets Plus offering because, you know, when it gets so cold and when maybe you don't have a blanket of your own, it's really nice to have someone who can give you a blanket, right? Remember when it was so cold at Christmas um, and we needed, even here in Fort Mill, to kind of snuggle up with our blankets? Yeah, so together as a church, we had to help other people find blankets when they may not be able to have one on their own. So here at the church today, we're taking up a special offering. It's called Blankets Plus Offering, and it goes with Church World Service. And just for $10, you can provide a blanket just like this for families who might find themselves in need. And whether that's somewhere close by, you know, like Fort Mill, where it gets really cold sometimes, or, or whether it's all around the world in places like Turkey, where they had that really, really bad earthquake this week, one of the most important things that we can provide is warm blankets. And today, our special offering, we take it up. And again, just $10 provides an offering and a blanket just like this. You think we should finish our time in prayer? All right, I think we should. Let's all pray together. I'll start, and then you guys can repeat after me. Dear God. Dear God. Thank you for our blankets. Thank you for our blankets. Help us to share your love. Help us to share your love. With those that are in need. With those that are in need. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you all so much for coming up this morning. Thank you, Matthew, for helping out today. And if you are headed to Children of Worship or Nursery, you can head out the door or back to your seats. We're going to surround you with our song of blessing.
Our second scripture reading for this morning comes from the songbook of Israel from the Psalms. And today we'll read the first eight verses of Psalm 119. Now this psalm is an extremely intricate and carefully crafted psalm. It's 176 verses are divided into 22 stanzas of eight verses each. And each stanza corresponds with one of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Thus, the first word in Hebrew in each verse of our text for today begins with the letter Aleph, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet. Verses 9 through 16 all begin with the letter Bet, the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet. And the pattern continues throughout the entire psalm. In addition, the psalmist also uses eight thematic terms, all related to God's Torah, in each one for each verse. And so through repetition, through variation, the psalmist has crafted this literary masterpiece about a single subject, the law. So let us hear this word of God. Happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are those who keep his decrees, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong but walk in his ways. You you, you have commanded your precepts to be kept diligently. Oh, that my ways may be steadfast in keeping your statutes. Then I shall not be put to shame, having my eyes fixed on all your commandments. I will praise you with an upright heart, When I learn your righteous ordinances, I will observe your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth, meditations of all our hearts, be acceptable in your sight, O Lord. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I need to go back to something that I said just a second ago and about Psalm 119. It is 176 verses long. It is massive. When Jason Biasi, a Methodist theologian and writer who now pastors in Toronto, Canada, was writing a commentary on the final third of the Psalter, so essentially Psalms 101 through 150, He got to skip Psalm 119. Why? Because another writer had written an entire commentary in the series, a whole volume, just on this one psalm. Biasi reflected, Psalm 119 is a microcosm of the whole Psalter, a miniature of the whole. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, 176 verses. And it basically says the same thing over and over with slight modification. Oh Lord, how I love thy law. Now at risk of putting myself at odds with my attorney, who also happens to be my wife, and with any other attorneys who might be present with us this morning, I will suggest that there are not many Protestant Christians today who would make that claim. O Lord, how I love thy law. And even if they did, for 176 verses, really? What in the world is going on in this psalm? Perhaps we can at least take some initial steps by noticing the key verbs from our text today. Those are verbs like walk, keep, or more precisely, keep watch, seek, and search. In the world today, we tend to think of the law as something that is fixed or established. You may remember a time not too long ago where there was a movement to mount the Ten Commandments on the walls of courthouses. And that makes sense if the law never changes and our only task is to obey it. But the opening verses here of Psalm 119 seem to suggest a different approach. 
The law is not something merely to be intellectually mastered and memorized. No one walks the law. One keeps watch with the law. One seeks and searches the law. These verbs imply movement and engagement, a a way of life, and even that the study of God's law is an active pursuit. That kind of engagement with the law is probably important if you're going to do it for 176 verses. In fact, the repeated pattern of this psalm with its verses beginning with the same letters and then using these interchangeable eight different terms for the law, it draws us in to a kind of meditation upon the law. Much like the songs we sing as a part of our evening Taze service once a quarter, you know, they seem pretty simple and straightforward. But as we chant and sing them multiple times, they move us into a spirit of prayer. You can certainly understand the words of those songs if you just read through them once. But to experience the truth of them, to walk with them, to sing them, to meditate upon them, to pray them, that makes all the difference. I think the same invitation is what's going on here in Psalm 119. You know, you can get the point of this psalm just by reading eight verses like we did today. But to be moved by them, to enter into them, we really need the whole psalm. Yes, a whole psalm saying the same thing over and over with slight modification. Oh Lord, how I love thy law. And as we begin to walk, as we begin to watch, keep watch, as we begin to seek and search for the will of the Lord in these verses and the ones that follow, I think we uncover something else. We discover the law as described here in this psalm is the Hebrew word Torah. And usually we translate Torah simply as law. But it really means so much more than that. In a way that would be quite cumbersome to use repeatedly, Torah really means something like God's instruction for a good and blessed life. Not just for you, but for the whole community, including the strangers and aliens who sojourn in your midst. That really is a mouthful. Let me repeat it for you again. God's instruction for a good and blessed life, not just for you, but for the whole community, including the strangers and aliens who sojourn in your midst. Now as we walk, as we keep watch, as we seek and search together around that, you can see perhaps we might begin to fall in love with it. Yes, this psalm is a meditation not upon God's commandments, but upon the goodness of the Lord expressed and intended by and in those commandments. Again, Jason Biasi writes, there's nearly nothing about the content of the law in all of this psalm. It goes on and on and on about how wonderful the law is, but it never tells us what the law is. Not once. If this was the only chapter, he writes, in the Bible that we had, we couldn't reconstruct even one of the Ten Commandments, let alone Scripture's 603 other commands. This psalm is an attitude adjustment not a content dump. My friends, I'd never seen that until this week. And it really is remarkable, and it opens the Torah, the law, in ways we rarely consider if our only relationship to the law is obedience. If we just learn the content and obey. What we find here instead in Psalm 119 is an invitation that draws us into a deeper relationship with God. 
into a deeper relationship with Jesus who said he came not to abolish the law but to fulfill the law. In the same way, Jesus later responds when he's asked, what's the greatest commandment in the law? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. On these two hang all the law and the prophets. Yes, maybe that's what Psalm 119 is trying to tell us over and over again with slight modifications. Oh Lord, how I love thy law. Again, I don't think that's our typical Protestant response. On the one hand, we tend to turn to strict adherence to the letter of the law. And on the other hand, we become so focused on grace that we forget about encouraging right action altogether. But in our best days, our Presbyterian Reformed tradition has had an appreciation for the law. For example, our theological ancestor John Calvin recognized three different uses for the law. The first was to prevent wrongdoing. If we know that a particular action or word has been declared to be wrong, we generally are less likely to do it. So the law prevents wrongdoing. Second use of the law is to convict or bring to repentance those who have broken it. Thus the law is enforced in ways to bring to our knowledge when we have trespassed or sinned and then to enact punishment or restitution as a result. But the final and the third and principal use, as Calvin says, when he writes, pertains more closely to the proper purpose of the law. It finds its place among believers in whose hearts the Spirit of God already lives and reigns. For even though they have the law written and engraved upon their hearts by the finger of God, that is, they've been moved and quickened through the directing of the Spirit, so now they long to obey God. Yes, those in whose hearts the Spirit of God already lives and reigns long to obey God because we know it is God's instruction for a good and blessed life not just for you, but for the whole community, including the strangers and aliens who sojourn in your midst. We seek to obey God because our hearts recognize, in the words of Psalm 119, that happy are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Let me give you an example of that. Right, even though we cannot find it in Psalm 119, I suspect that we all generally know the sixth commandment, which is thou shall not kill. It's certainly a prohibition against bad behavior. It brings to our knowledge the ways in which we fall short, but it is also the means of organizing a community of faith so that all may flourish. Thus, for example, in the Westminster Larger Catechism, we find this reflection on the Sixth Commandment. The Sixth Commandment, thou shall not kill, requires us to do our best to make every lawful effort to preserve our own life and the life of others. We do this not by thinking about or planning, by controlling our emotions, and by avoiding all opportunities, temptations, or actions that would promote or lead to the unjust taking of someone's life. In the pursuit of that goal, we must defend others from violence, patiently endure the afflictions from God's hands, have a quiet mind and a cheerful spirit, practice temperance in the way we eat, drink, take medications, sleep, work, and play. We should also harbor charitable thoughts, love, compassion, meekness, gentleness, and kindness. Our speech and behavior should be peaceful, mild, and courteous. We should be tolerant of others, 
Be ready to be reconciled. Patiently put up with and forgive injuries against others and return good for evil. Finally, we should provide aid and comfort to those in distress as well as protect and defend the innocent. My friends, that's from 1640. Do you think it might be applicable to this world in which we live today? I doubt that's what we typically think of, though, when we hear the commandment, thou shalt not kill. My friends, to walk in the way of the Lord, to keep watch over the commandments, to seek and search out God's instruction is not merely obedience which restrains wrongdoing. It's to enter a path of blessedness and flourishing and concern and love for God and for others. It commits us to defending others, to patiently enduring afflictions, to practicing temperance and peaceful speech and toleration and returning good for evil. It draws us into providing aid and comfort to those who are in distress, as well as protecting and defending the innocent. Yes, participating in the goodness of the Lord is what it means to be a law-abiding Christian. We will fall short. There's no doubt about that. We will need to be reminded again and again. But perhaps the best we can do in our words and our actions is to repeat over and over with slight modification, O oh Lord, how I love thy law. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Oh Lord, you speak your word to us. We forget. We try to make it just about obedience as opposed to relationship and flourishing and life as we see in you and particularly in Jesus. Remind us again. Forgive us. Inspire us so that together we might, as a community, flourish. And not just us, but the strangers and aliens who sojourn in our midst. For we pray these things in Christ's holy name. Amen. My friends, in response to hearing Scripture read and proclaimed, I invite you to stand that together we might affirm what it is that we believe. Today we use words from the Scots Confession as you find them printed in your bulletin. We confess and acknowledge that the law of God is most just, equal, holy, and perfect, commanding those things which, when perfectly done, can give life and bring human beings to eternal felicity. But our natures are so corrupt, weak, and imperfect that we are never able to perfectly fulfill the works of the law. Even after we are reborn, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth of God is not in us. It is therefore essential for us to lay hold of Christ Jesus in his righteousness and atonement, since he is the end and consummation of the law and since it is by him that we are set at liberty, so that the curse of God may not fall upon us, even though we do not fulfill the law in all its points. You may be seated. Friends, one of the ways that we respond to the word read and proclaimed is to join together in prayer. And so let us now do that. Let us pray. O oh God, you are just, and you treat your people with fairness. 
From our foremothers and forefathers, we have learned your commandments, how you desire love of neighbor and not empty praise, how you called for justice and mercy rather than rites and rituals, how in, your, in our search for your justice, we should show kindness, not a spirit of reprisal. We learn from Jesus, whom you sent to show us your perfect way. As he went about healing, his disciples learned of love. As he taught in the temple, his followers heard of your promise of new life. And in his death, the world would know that you are a God of infinite love. That same Jesus whom you raised from the dead is our chief priest and intercedes on our behalf. We are strengthened by that knowledge. We still have a distance to go in our quest of co commitment and growth. Help us to learn from children what it means to have faith. May we not be afraid of dependence when it comes to trusting in you. Let us learn from our enemies what it means to forgive. May we not be so sure of ourselves that we condemn others whom you also save. Let us learn from the foreigner what it means to dwell in a strange land and offer hospitality to the rootless, the homeless, and the estranged of this world. Especially today, O oh God, our hearts reach out to the earthquake victims in Syria and Turkey. Continue to nourish and sustain us that we may nurture according to your design for our lives. We are your agents in bringing others to faith. May our lives be for them an example of the confidence and endurance that comes from assurance of Christ's love. May our care of and compassion toward them be a constant reminder of our abiding presence and may our ministries to them be evidence of the fruit of an obedient life. We continue to pray with one voice the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, because the grace of God has been poured out so abundantly in our lives, let us now respond by bringing to the Lord the tithes and the offerings of our hearts and of our hands. And once again, I would remind you of our blanket offering this morning. A $10 donation will provide one blanket. A $50 donation will provide blankets for a whole family. Let us receive our gifts.
God from whom all blessings flow. Let us pray. We praise and thank you, bountiful God, for all good gifts you bestow upon us. We offer but a portion of that bounty you bestow, O God. Receive our gifts as we seek to walk in your way. Where justice is sought, use these gifts to bring Christ's liberating word. Where there is pain, May they bring healing in Christ's love. We pray in the name of him who intercedes on our behalf, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen.
My friends, as we go forth from this place, as our service of worship concludes, may our lives of worship and service begin anew. May we love the Lord. May we love the law. For together we might seek and walk and search and keep the ways that enable flourishing, not just for us, but for our whole community and the strangers and aliens who sojourn in our midst. As we go, may the love of God, the fellowship of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the peace of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.